I would argue that the most serious threat to the United States is not someone hiding in a cave in Afghanistan or Pakistan, but our own fiscal irresponsibility. What hit the economy first was a housing slump. Fears spread to Wall Street. Consumers tightened their purse strings. The U.S. Federal Reserve cut its key interest rate by half a point. The I word, inflation, is coming to the fore. Major developments on the lending crisis in the U.S. Oil and gold prices are spiking. Nuclear strike here on our financial and market. And it's complicated because of where we are in the election cycle. Huge disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street. David Walker and why should we care? He's the nation's top accountant, the Comptroller General of the United States. He's totaled up the government's income, liabilities, and future obligations and concluded that our current standard of living is unsustainable unless some drastic action is taken. And he's not alone. We suffer from a fiscal cancer. It is growing within us. And if we do not treat it, it could have catastrophic consequences for our country. How big is the federal debt? I don't know. <laughs> I'm guessing quite a bit. I know it's a heck of a lot more than it was probably 10 years ago. Well, take a stab at it. 69 billion. <laughs> it's probably huge. What if I told you it was 8.7 trillion dollars? <laughs> That's pretty crazy. Wow. It shouldn't be that way. $8.7 trillion. Just how much money is that? With a number this large, it helps to compare it to the overall size of America's economy, what economists call the gross domestic product, or GDP. In February 2007, when our federal debt was $8.7 trillion, our GDP was around $13.5 trillion. That meant that our federal debt was about 64% of our GDP. This level of debt to GDP is not the real problem. It's where we're headed that matters. If you were to add up all the federal government's unfunded promises for Medicare and Social Security, you would see that as of September 30, 2007, America had dug itself into a $53 trillion hole, and it's getting deeper by at least two to three trillion dollars every year by doing nothing. Unfortunately, with increasing budget deficits and recent government bailouts, we're now digging even faster. America faces four serious deficits today. The first is a budget deficit. The second is a savings deficit. The third is a balance of payments deficit, of which the trade deficit is a subset. And the fourth and most serious of all is a leadership deficit. How can this be happening to the richest country in the world? Well, we've lost our way, quite frankly. Uh, let me tell you how we got to where we are. Today's federal debt is the sum of all of our annual budget deficits and surpluses going back to the beginning of our federal government. Our war for independence created much of our early debt, and by March 4th, 1789, the first day of our federal government, our national debt was $75 million, which was about 40% of our economy. This terrified our founding fathers, and they acted quickly to pay it down. We didn't stay there for long. The Civil War not only had a huge human cost, it brought the United States to the brink of bankruptcy. However, like before, we paid our debt down quickly. In 1913, the Federal Reserve System was created to help manage the nation's money supply and to oversee national banks. That year was also the birth of the modern income tax. World War I was supposed to be the war to end all wars. Several years later, the Great Depression brought with it extreme economic hardship for millions of Americans. This social security measure gives at least some protection to 30 millions of our citizens it is insurance 
that you and your employer have bought and paid for. World War II was a time of sacrifice, and while the government took on unprecedented levels of debt, Americans bought savings bonds to finance our winning the war. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Humphrey Bogart. Our fighting men have just won history's greatest victory for freedom. Buy bonds for their future and for your own future. We've got another bond to buy. It's official. It's all over. It's total victory. The large military and social spending practices of the 1960s and 70s were two key factors that led to a major economic downturn by the end of the 1970s. The 1980s saw the rise of supply-side economics. It's morning again in America. Reaganomics. You're uh, the trickle-down theory guy. I'm betting my reputation on it. The controversial Laffer curve proposed that lower marginal tax rates would eventually generate higher tax revenues. The theory did have its critics. Let me just give you a difference that I have with Governor Reagan on taxes. It is what I call a voodoo economic policy. For decades, we have piled deficit upon deficit, mortgaging our future and our children's future for the temporary convenience of the present. Read my lips. The debate over supply-side economics continues to this day. But what is not debatable is that the federal debt exploded in the 1980s. A fundamental shift had occurred. America was becoming addicted to debt. Never before in our history had so much debt been created during an era of relative peace and prosperity. Yes, the Cold War ended, but it came at an extremely high price, and people from across the political spectrum were becoming very alarmed. today, Democrats and Republicans, to celebrate a true milestone for our nation. In a few moments, I will sign into law the first balanced budget in a generation. The politics of, of sound fiscal policy are very difficult because the natural inertia in the political system, if you will, is toward federal programs, most of which are, are very useful. And therefore, the, the inertia is toward spending on the one hand and tax cuts on the other hand. But if you're going to have sound fiscal conditions, you have got to both constrain your spending and you also have to provide for adequate revenues. And what ultimately is involved are very difficult trade-off decisions involving federal programs and what the American people want their government to do and then providing the means to pay for it. In the last 40 years, we've had 35 budget deficits and only five budget surpluses. But remember, we've been running large annual surpluses in our Social Security program for years. These surpluses are spent every year to help pay other bills in the federal government. Without the Social Security surpluses, 
our real track record on deficits looks a whole lot worse. This is something that's utterly unsustainable. And remember, all of that has happened before the baby boomers retire. And the baby boomers are not a projection. They're born, they're out there, they're gonna be eligible for Social Security and Medicare, and yet we can't pay our bills now. In less than 10 years, Social Security will be paying out more than it takes in, and it will only get worse as baby boomers retire in larger and larger numbers. By 2017, Social Security will not be helping to reduce our overall deficit, it will be adding to it. Our enormous Medicare deficits and other federal spending that also lie ahead will only make this situation worse. The only issue that's more severe than this would be the idea that an Islamic fundamentalist would get his hands on or her hands on a nuclear weapon and use it against us. Beyond that, there's nothing that's more severe than this. this, this issue represents the potential fiscal meltdown of this nation and it absolutely guarantees if it's not addressed that our children will have less of a quality of life than we've had. That they, that they will have a government they can't afford uh, and that we will be demanding so much of them in the area of taxes that they will not have the money to send their kids to college or buy that home or just live a good quality of life. It stinks. You know, our parents talk our ears off from the time we're 10 about financial responsibility. This is what you have to do. Don't get into credit card debt. You have to pay for what you buy. You have to s save your money. And then the politicians who are supposed to represent your values and represent what you want, they aren't doing the same thing. They're telling you one thing and doing another thing. Would you like to go on a date with me? No. Would you like to learn about the debt? Yes. It's hard to really, really get kids inspired, but I think we're starting to do that. It sort of gives you hope. Right now, if you look at the federal budget, it's running a deficit, and it will probably run a deficit for the next uh, several years. Those deficits are not off the charts. We've been there before. But what is really worrisome is the longer-run future. If you look at just three programs, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, the spending for those programs under current rules will rise very rapidly over the next few years, indeed for the foreseeable future. Longevity increases and rising medical care spending are symptoms of being a rich country. However, we've got to do something about it. Unless we're willing to raise taxes and keep on raising them or close down the rest of the federal government, we've got a very big problem staring us in the face. Did you know millions of Americans live with debt they cannot control? That's why I developed this unique new program for managing your debt. It's called Don't Buy Stuff You Cannot Afford. Oh. Let me see that. If you don't have any money, you should not buy anything. Hmm, sounds interesting. Sounds confusing. I don't know, honey. This makes a lot of sense. There's a whole section here on how to buy expensive things using money you save. Give me that. And where would you get this saved money? How much money do you guys have in your savings accounts? Uh, a couple hundred bucks. Uh, about a thousand, maybe. You, are you talking about money-wise? I end up using most of the money in my savings account, so it doesn't really like work as a savings account. Like, I'm not actually saving anything. I'm just storing it there. <laughs> I think most people can say that they um, live paycheck to paycheck. I think the good majority of us do. David, we've got you right here. Robert, you're right over here. The introductions. This is Dean Board. I'm David Yepsen, and I'm a political columnist with the Des Moines Register. But I think this issue is really the most important issue facing the country. Too many Americans are following the bad example of their federal government. 
They're spending more money than they make. They're taking out home equity loans. They're charging up their credit cards. They're building up compound interest and seeing the day in the not-too-distant future where they may not be able to make the minimum Does payment. that exacerbate the national problem? It clearly does because for two years in a row, American households have spent more money than they took home. A negative savings rate. The last time that happened was 1933 and 1934. Not good years for America or the world. Now, we're in a very different situation than 1933 and 1934. But the reason we have to borrow from foreign players who hold more of our national mortgage, who have more leverage on us and we have less leverage on them, is because we're not saving, and that's got to change. I think it's going to take a crisis before America responds to this. We're not going to be willing to take this pain until it gets to be a real problem. The concepts of sacrificing and building for a better tomorrow have been pushed aside by our live for today, easy credit, and consumption-oriented society. Many Americans have never seen a rainy day and therefore simply choose not to save for one. This is a major problem because savings results in increased investment, additional research and development, a stronger economy, and an improvement in our overall standard of living. Savings essentially is putting aside part of what you produce, part of your income, to have provision for the future. What these various different deficits are suggesting is that we are trying to consume more than we produce. We can do that in the short run, but over the long run, it is of course impossible. Without savings, there is no future. Americans must start to save again, and they need to invest those savings to help create a better future for themselves, their families, and our country. When I say trade deficit, do you know what that means? Um, deficit usually means something like uh, disorder or something, so something is wrong with it. It's not good. It's the money that the United States owes. <laughs> is the trade deficit with other countries, maybe? So if we have a trade deficit, we're importing more than we're exporting. Okay, there it is. <laughs> in 2007, China had the largest trade surplus in the world. And who was dead last? the United States of America. Yeah, a few years ago, I wrote an article for Fortune on sort of the parable of uh, Squandersville and, and, and Thriftsville, which was designed to simplify for people problems inherent in persistent and large trade imbalances. Economics tends to put people to sleep, and I thought maybe by creating a couple of islands with inhabitants of quite widely different <laughs> activities that it, it might get across a point that otherwise they get lost on. The thrust is that, that if you own a lot of property, an island in this case, you can trade it off for the things that you eat and consume every day, and you can do that for a long time, but eventually you run out of property and then you have to work a whole lot harder to provide your own needs, but also to pay back for the debt you've incurred. Short-term actions have long-term consequences that sometimes people don't think about uh, in the short run. If you're buying more than you're selling, which is what a trade deficit is, eventually your trading partners are going to own a lot of your wealth. When they are not buying your goods and services with this money, they will be looking for ways to invest it. Running large and persistent trade imbalances can be problematic, especially when a country has a low savings rate and its government needs to borrow more money every year to pay its bills. government needs to borrow money. Yeah. Do you know how they do that? I'm under the assumption that everyone else borrows money from us, so... In the past, when we ran large budget deficits, our government turned to Americans to borrow that money. After World War II, virtually all the federal debt was owed to Americans. Today, our high budget deficits 
our low personal savings rate, and large trade deficits have caused us to become increasingly reliant on foreigners to finance our debt and provide capital for investment. There's nothing inherently wrong with this in the short term, and the truth is America lends money to other countries. However, as our reliance on foreign lenders increases every year, one might ask, what are the longer-term consequences? In the fall of 1956, the world was on the brink of a major international conflict. America's allies, Britain and France, were engaged in a battle against Egypt over control of the Suez Canal. The Soviet Union was threatening to intervene on the side of Egypt. America wanted to avoid military action at any cost and demanded that the British and French allies withdraw from the region. When their request was denied, the U.S. turned to financial warfare. America, which at that time owned much of England's debt, threatened to sell off or dump a significant part of its holdings in the British pound. This would have effectively destroyed England's currency. The result? All British and French military forces withdrew from the Suez region within weeks. If 15 or 20 years from now, two or three percent of the GDP is being paid abroad merely to service the debts or the ownership of assets that have been incurred because we're over-consuming, that will be politically unstable. While it can't be measured in dollar terms, our leadership deficit is our nation's biggest challenge. Too many of our current leaders know we are facing a financial crisis, yet they lack the courage to do something about it. President Bush, 43, uh, asked me to come back to the government and be the Secretary of the Treasury, which I did for uh, 23 months uh, before I got fired for uh, having a difference of opinion. For the record, the White House is saying that Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill and top economic advisor Larry Lindsay tendered their resignations voluntarily. The Vice President said, uh, the President's decided to make some changes and you're one of the changes. And what we'd like to do is uh, have you come over and meet with the president and uh, basically say that uh, you've decided to go back to the private sector. You know, for me to say that I've decided to uh, leave the Treasury is a lie. And I'm not into doing lies. And so that was it. I went back to my office latched up my briefcase and went down to the parking space that's reserved for the Secretary of the Treasury, got in my car and drove back to Pittsburgh. 
Well, you know, it's a first in my life. I'd never been fired before. I'd only been promoted to ever higher levels of responsibility. But, you know, it was okay with me uh, because I would have really been uncomfortable uh, arguing for policies I didn't believe in. I argued during the second half of 2002, we should not have another tax cut. That was not a popular view. And in fact, it led to a conversation with the vice president where he basically told me that we don't have to worry about deficits, you know, which I got to tell you was really a shock to me. You know, when we, the Bush 43 administration took over, we had something over five, maybe $5.6 trillion worth of national debt. Today, I think the number is $8.8 .8 trillion. That's not an innocent change. It is a monumental change in the debt service that we have to do in addition to and on top of all of the other things that our country needs to do. You know, I think we only need to look at the fate of other countries who've lived beyond their means for a long time. You inevitably get into trouble. When you get extended to the point that you can't service your debt, you're finished. Some people think that we can solve our financial problems by stopping fraud, waste, and abuse, or by canceling the Bush tax cuts, or by ending the war in Iraq. The truth is, we could do all three of these things, and we would not come close to solving our nation's fiscal challenges. Here's how bad our situation really is. We already have approximately $11 trillion in total liabilities, including public debt. To this amount, you need to add the current unfunded obligations for Social Security benefits of about $7 trillion. Then add Medicare's unfunded promises, $34 trillion, of which about $26 trillion relates to Medicare Parts A and B, and about $8 trillion relates to Medicare Part D, the new prescription drug benefit, which some claimed would save money in overall Medicare costs. Add another trillion dollars in miscellaneous items, and you get $53 trillion. Our country would need $53 trillion invested today, which is about $175,000 per person, to deliver on the government's obligations and promises. How much of this $53 trillion do we have? Zip. By the time today's college graduates are ready to retire, 40 years from now, the only things our government will be able to pay for are interest on the federal debt and some Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid benefits. All other parts of the federal government will be closed and out of business. What about taxes? We would have to raise federal tax burdens across the board, more than two times today's levels, to close the financing gap. Some politicians complain when any tax increases are mentioned. We're facing a more than doubling of federal taxes if we continue down our present path. Remember our debt to GDP? By the year 2040, our debt to GDP will be twice the record level at the end of World War II. And it skyrockets after that. Who's going to lend us money then? No matter what you personally believe should be done to address our nation's deficits, the magnitude of our problem is much bigger than people understand. Let's assume for a moment that all earmarks and special interest pork barrel spending were eliminated. They only represent about 1% of our annual federal spending. What if all three Bush tax cuts expired in 2010? That would only address about 10% of our federal financial hole. And what about Iraq? Even if the war ended in 2009, the total estimated cost of the war over time is less than 3% of our total financial problem. Our budget, savings, trade, and leadership deficits individually are bad enough, but in combination, they create a toxic mix that threatens our countries and our families' futures. As the baby boomers retire in large numbers, this tidal wave of spending will reach our shores, and we are simply not prepared for it. And trust me, it could swamp our ship of state. Unlike many other problems facing our country, this one is ours alone. We can and we must solve this one. The question is, when will we? As our nation's founders said, 
It's really up to us. We the people. If you're concerned about our nation's four deficits and you want to do something about them, please sign up under the Citizen Action section of our website at pgpf.org. Working together, we can make sure that our future is better than our past.